So in this last um, lecture, we're going to talk about construction methods. And the first part um, of this chat, we're going to talk about found objects. For example, this was um, an ostrich egg um, found and used by Phoenicians, decorated and used as a drinking vessel. So some things are found and used just as they are, except in this case, some kind of painted on embellishment. Um, this is called the Queen's Head. It's in Taiwan. And some land forms are celebrated just as they are. People saw this on the landscape and went, oh, that looks like a regal female head. And so it just became something that was venerated over time. So no one actually made it. It was found um, just the way it is. Although I'd have to say over time and erosion, this has gotten thinner and thinner. And I think at this point, there is some real danger of the whole head toppling over. These things are formed because the rock up above is harder than the next layer and so this layer erodes and the upper part not so much and over time that's why these things break i think you'll see similar things in the um, southwest of, of our own country and here's duchamp's um, bottle rack um, and he would call these ready-mades he would just basically this is a rack that people in France would wash their wine bottles out and stick upside down the, the necks over these pegs here and let them dry and then reuse them again. And so he just liked the form or whatever. And it, it, it started up on that a whole chat about an artist's intent. So if I call it art, then it is art. It gets very philosophical, but just know that this is out there and it is a beautiful form. I'm sure we've all picked up, you know, rocks on a beach or a, an old bottle or a piece of uh, an old piece of wood, carved wood from a furn piece of furniture or old nails, whatever. And we think, oh, what a what a neat thing. Same sort of thing. Found objects. And some cultures um, would take various objects, like obviously this creature here um, was carved, but then this is in Africa. It's a fetish figure. And with the introduction of um, European cultures or other more advanced cultures at the time, they brought in nails and other pieces of metal, forged metal, pieces of wood, and added it to another piece, giving it sort of uh, making it some, somehow more personally powerful. So an assemblage or assemblage. This is in um, Japan, um, a Shinto shrine, and Shinto is another um, religion that is native to the Japanese. And it usually involves these little uh, white fox dog kind of creatures here and a little temple. And you can see that people will will bring objects or things to eat and drink or candles or whatever to add to it. Um, so making a beautiful additive assembled art piece. Some people just, and this you can, those of you who have gotten to your last um, long hop, you know, I offered you up a box, um, a box kind of project here. Let me bring this up a little bit. So this is Lucas Samaras, and he's made all kinds of these crazy box sculptures so he finds a box oftentimes you know really cigar boxes are really quite fantastic i don't know if this is one or not but um and with you know sort of 
personal iconography. I'm not sure what they're about. I have never really studied him that much. But you can see here just on a very superficial level, he you know, had yarn that he loved the way that it went. And you'll see Mexican cultures that use this sort of impressing inlaying of yarn. Um, other found objects, um, little glass marbles, um, a little grasshopper. I don't, this looks like crushed glass or crushed quartz or something like that. Anyway, taking very tactile um, materials that he liked the look and feel of and created these really pretty wonderful boxes. So you guys should try and take a look at him. Lucas Samaras, S-A-M-A-R-A-S. Fantastic. Pablo Picasso, this is bamboo and young. So um, this is actually cast, but the original, before it was cast, um, he put together all kinds of found objects, but most specifically this toy um, car up on the top. And he's so famous for this, this piece. And this is what you might call junk sculpture. You're going to hear a lot of funny terms over the years, and I just want to introduce you to some. So junk sculpture puts it together. He has it cast in bronze, and now it's an incredibly famous piece. Here's another one, somebody just taking joy in finding old pieces of metal. This is Richard Stankovitz, um, and either welding it or somehow adhering pieces together. This is called City Bird. This is a piece called Orpheus, um, taking found objects. This, they're calling this in the junk sculpture um, category. There's an old wooden doll's body. And this big piece here, parts of this, is a vice, a wooden vice, where you use it to clamp things down um, to make certain that the piece that you're clamping doesn't move. And then there's these sort of orbs in the back. This is a really interesting piece. And he did several pieces that have the same name of Orpheus. And if you don't know um, the story, Orpheus goes underground to get his wife back down into Hades. And people take pity on him down there. And they say, sure, Eurydice, your wife, can go back with you. But you cannot turn around to look at her until you have reached the sun, you know, outside in the sunshine. Well, he gets almost up to the top. I don't know, some calamity goes on. He turns around, and of course, he's broken the spell, and she goes back to Hades. But so this is sort of a convoluted thing here. Is this Eurydice being clamped down so that she doesn't look back? Or are they just sort of combining that whole idea of her looking forward and clamping her to look forward. I don't know, but it just just like some sorts of, of poetry, you just start taking the images in your head and you don't really have to understand every bit of it. It just is, and you get something from it. Um, installations most often are, are, are a lot of them are found objects. So I don't know where they got all these cutouts, maybe large um, industrial address um, numbers, but hanging them from the ceiling and possibly painting them, or, or, or maybe there's some lights involved here as well. But um, yeah, it's sort of, I mean, when I see the O's and the ones, I start thinking of computer code and stuff, but um, you know, it's sort of a, a contemporary math nightmare in a way, but very cool. Makes me think of the World Wide Web. Um, here's another one with a skull. This is called Confetti Death. Um, it's an installation there again in a gallery. Um, some sort of under form in here, but this skull is spewing out really like a primary color vomit, but it's all 
paper pieces and stuff. So more um, found objects in an installation. This is um, Watts Towers. I'm sure you've heard of Watts in, in the Los Angeles area, a neighborhood down there that's seen a lot of turmoil. But in the middle of it is this um, Portuguese immigrant, Simon Rodia, who was trained as a, a tile setter, um, would come home after work and own this piece of property. And he started creating, he obviously had some welding skills too, creating these huge towers in the middle of this kind of um, dilapidated neighborhood. And I mean, his entire life or the end of his entire life, 30 some years, and he would lay tiles, old plates, glass, seashells, other found objects to make this sort of, um, I mean, it really looks like um, in Barcelona, the, um, what's his name, uh, Gaudí's pieces. They're again, probably something very spiritual, um, uplifting, um, a, just really a joy in making things, actually. I don't know if the place, I think you can go there and visit. I don't know whether it ever really was finished, completed all the way. Here's another part. Here's the man right there up on top. Um, you can see some of the tile work there. Pretty wonderful. He must have had kind of a fantastic life in his little world. Now we're going to move on to another construction method. So we've got found objects. Now we're moving on to addition. Addition where you add stuff together, where you put material together to build something. And then after that, we're going to go to subtraction, where you are start with a bigger piece of material and start cutting or taking material away. So let's look at addition. Um, this is a Mayan incense burner. Um, I couldn't tell you what century, but this is old, you know, probably I'm going to say in my memory about 600 BC. Um, and clay is such a wonderfully, some of you worked with it, tactile material. Um, you can add it, subtract, push, pull, cut into it, carve out. I mean, all kinds of stuff. It's just wonderfully tactile because of the of the material that it is with small platelets that sort of nest together. They, they can create a, a strong kind of bond when the, the little platelets lay on top of each other. And hence, you can do things. Here's some more clay. Here's somebody throwing a bowl. And you can see how, um, and this is done with centrifugal um, force here centering it where you would get it all compact, opening it up. Anyway, this person is basically stretching the sides of the clay here. In this case, not just with their fingers, but finishing off with two what we call ribs. And it has such strength with these platelets holding it together that you can stretch, stretch, stretch that material quite far. Makes throwing very fun. Here's some more ceramics. Um, this is done by Peter Bolkus, um, Northern California sculptor, um, instructor, most lastly at um, UC Berkeley. He really was the, the, the godfather of abstract expressionism in in ceramics and ceramics up until then was really seen as sort of a at least on our coast i, th I think mostly in the northern hemisphere um, as functional um, plates and bowls and cups and vases and and this and that and he moved it on to a more massive contemporary sculptural material but there again using traditional 
ceramic techniques. In this case, there was probably some throwing involved. He was a huge man. I mean, he had hands that were twice as big as yours and mine. Um, a big rock of a man who could throw humongous chunks of clay. But in this case, he's also using slab work, um, maybe even some coil work, but traditional methods, and then puts them together, maybe carving and whacking. There again, abstract expressionism really kind of emoting um, on these stacked chunks um, of clay. They're really quite beautiful to me. Um, cars traditionally, and I have a feeling maybe still, because it's such the perfect material, you're asking the ceramic person, have, have been made out of, first, the design is carved out of clay. Um, you might think, oh, why don't they just make a beautiful little model? It would be so much easier. And then just use 3D printing and blow it up, whatever. And, and, and maybe it will come to that. But sometimes you really need to see a piece in its actual size before you go casting it or manufacturing millions of these things for the next 10 years until you get a new design or whatever. Um, you really can see details and I mean how does this line work with um, you know this line and this line and this you know you really you get to see the details better and in this case you can see they're using some very precise measuring tool that will help them set up um, the process for making molds but this is how it was done, and those of you who have worked with clay and, and loop tools, um, carving tools, just shaving off tiny bits of clay or adding them, there again, we're, we're in the additive phase here um, to get just the perfect form. So what do you do with those ceramics? This is just sort of a little addendum here. You've got your pots, your little handmade pots or thrown pots. This is a traditional pit firing where you just pile the work um, with other inflammable materials, um, wood, dung, leaves, whatever it may be, sawdust, wood chips ignite it, it burns down, it gets to a certain temperature. Um, nowadays, this would be a kill probably in a, in a university, um, only I'm saying that because of the two side by side here. This just looks like the way big universities have ceramic departments. This is a gas kill um, made of bricks with metal um, structure to hold it all together. You can see over here the pipes for the gas, usually oftentimes propane in, in California anyway. The gas goes in here. There's a number of burners on the bottom. You can see the little holes there where the, the flames shoot in at the bottom. This is an updraft kill. The flames swirl around. Your pieces would be stacked inside of here on top of shelves. These bricks would hold up the shelves. So, like a layer cake or, a, or a, a wedding cake, where a shelf, these bricks, another shelf, the where tucked in all these shelves up to the top. The flames and the heat, it gets hotter and hotter and they're swirling around and zoom up out the flue. Also quite fun to do. But with, with gas, you can control it a whole lot more, um, less breakage, you can get to a specific temperature so you're not under firing the clay and you're not over firing and melting the clay. Um, another material, um, this actually is bronze, but this horse by Degas was made of wax. And so you can see the wonderful, I love seeing wax cast pieces um, because there's always this 
kind of great impasto um, texture on them where you could really see the hand of the artist or you know a tool that he or she worked the piece with. This would be really pretty hard to do in clay, but it was done in wax, probably with little little armature underneath, and then through the lost wax um, casting method, turn it into this fantastic, wonderful little bronze horse. Plaster is another additive material. This is Manuel Neri, also um, uh, Central California sculptor. Um, he would start, here's a wooden base, have a wood or metal interior armature here. Um, and really, if you broke these things apart, oftentimes these artists had wood, metal, whatever it would take fabric knotted around and then you keep building the plaster up on top of that you don't want to just keep globbing plaster on top of plaster you so you start out with uh, a really built up armature underneath and then start adding plaster um, then he started painting these oftentimes pl plaster you just think oh white you can actually colorize plaster um, same with concrete and people are doing a little more work with uh, being able to add concrete and mixed concretes up a little bit more but he often would then just paint the outsides and they're they're pretty wonderful you can see he's got bright yellow often he does primary colors they're pretty wonderful nice textures um this is westerman hc westerman um so this is using wood and wood you often I often just immediately think of subtractive and carving but here there he's taking pieces of wood you know planed wood or whatever that milled that he got at a lumber yard and then added that together sort of fabricated these pieces so we're looking a little bit of fabrication which is also an additive technique and he like like Lucas Samaras you know put crazy things in these boxes. They were pretty much contemporaries and friends. Um, you know, here's some clothespins and a pencil and really very, very fun. Another art box, but kind of fabricated additive piece. Um, you can also take metal and fabricate it in this case taking metal and pounding it out um, to flatten it and to make shapes out of it in this case copper over this big steel form here so by hitting it your your if the material is malleable enough soft enough like copper is you can kind of stretch 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 which each each pound it thins it and stretches the material and you can also form it and shape it a little bit, particularly by using um, the form you want or similar arcs underneath. This is forged steel. So by adding chunks of steel and using heat, um, welding and forging pieces, melting things together, hammering them. It's a sort of a funny frog creature. Um, fiber became a very, um, at least on the West Coast or the United States, I think at least in um, the Northern Hemisphere, using fibers in like the 50s, 60s, 70s really started a, a blossoming of using yarns and twines and other um, fibers like wool and, and, and plant materials um, to weave, crochet, um, darn, um, knit, knot, whatever it is together to make really incredible sculptures. It was a really exciting time for me to see um, what fiber artists would do and then growing out of this really um you know 
clothing design take off because they were sort of turned on to all the crazy, wonderful, wild forms you could make just with sculpture. So a lot of clothing designers kind of hopped on the back of that. Okay, so here more crocheted. Um, this is twine. So you might crochet a material out of twine, a soft thing, but then maybe you coat it with paint or lacquer or something that will make it stiff. So this is a very cool um, piece, I think, a hand. And with the transparencies, um, you can see through and see the sort of shadow of a hand, but touching this lump down there, is that a hand touching a pregnant belly? Is it the hand of God touching earth? Who knows, but it's, it's a very beautiful, thoughtful piece. Um, a wooden sculpture here. Um, it's called Skirt, the Borders Between Comedy, Pathos, Delight, and Horror. What a title, huh? So anyway, a wooden sculpture and then adding this beaded, um, using beading and sort of weaving techniques, this beaded dress and creatures crawling up on this sort of fetishistic um, figure here, female form. Here's a piece made out of handmade paper, which is pretty funny. Is this the artist? Um, I'm looking at an apron here, which I always wear to work in my studio. Um, but then there are these high heels down here. And, and then there's the shell of the artist right here. So you kind of think, well, kind of the dichotomy of this woman who works but goes out or you know the universality of it i don't know but it's pretty funny to me i can at the end of a really hard day that's sort of what you feel like isn't it um here's taking dyed recycled clothing whether it's dyed or not um you could go to the your thrift store and only buy certain hues um, contingent colors there uh, and make something really beautiful like this. I think, you know, it would be fun with all rainbows of colors, but I sort of like this kind of these cold colors mashed up um, to make the leaves here. And is this water? Is this a waterway here? Here they are kind of bundled up to look like rolled river rocks and vegetation in the back. A pretty neat installation. Here's another installation made out of fishing line. It makes me want to think a lot of times installations have to do with environmental things. This is found fishing line. Um, you know, if any of you have walked along the side of a reservoir um, when the water has gone down a little bit or out um, on the ocean, oftentimes you'll find fishing gear. Um, so is this somebody recycling this fishing line? I don't know, but the way you can imagine that, that, that filament wire or filament line that they use, but really in incredible lighting here to hit these and, and they just glow. So kind of a exciting piece using a black background here, um, looking like, like economical jellyfish. Um, here's another really fun, let's see if I can blow this up for you a little bit. This is Dale Chihuly, kind of the premier, um, at least on the West Coast, um, art, sculpture, glass blower. He used to do all the glass blowing, but now he got so famous that he has young guys do the blowing. So here's the pipe. You get a, a, a glob of molten glass on the end of a pipe. Really, really hot. There's, you know, somewhere there's a, a, a kind of a cauldron of glass. So anyway, you take this, you put it in the furnace, and then you twist this pole and start blowing in there. And it's kind of, it's kind of like throwing ceramics in a way with that centrifugal force 
billowing the form outward. But anyway, here's Dale Chihuly. Once this form has been made, this might have just been a big bowl. And then he comes in here with these wooden paddles and puts, puts um, you know, scallops in here and grooves and shapes it and paddles it. And it will be a, a, a time of successively going back and forth from the heat to soften it up just to the right amount and then bringing it out and having someone else shape it if you're going to go into one of these more sculptural um, forms. And here's one of his pieces, one of his installations. Come on here. Let's get you back down. Okay. Um, this is called Persian ceiling, kind of a takeoff on Persian rugs. Um, so this would be a room, an installation with a glass ceiling, and then he, these glass forms that often look like sea creatures. He's done a lot of sea, ocean, kind of um, marine installations. Fabulous. I mean, where you you would be walking on top of glass, you know, over the top of these or on the sides and using lighting to get these amazing effects and um, really quite beautiful. Um, a little more fabrication here. Um, so now we've got wood. So you take wood, you can sand it, plane it, do whatever you want, and add it together. This is a very beautiful designed um, baby's cradle. Um, these are some subtractive parts where places were carved. But these are big um, tree trunks taken as a group and added together to make this forest here in the, this, this gallery installation. So in this case, adding these big monolithic forms to make a forest here. Um, this is an artist named Jackie Windsor. She did a lot of fiber um, pieces, but she made these wooden, this wooden grid and then bound them together. They're really pretty wonderful. They're again in a kind of an orderly, almost computer world um, preview. These are bound together like big balls of string that hold this grid together, which are beautiful in themselves. And then you start looking at the negative spaces in between and even the shadows that it makes, that the light, that the light makes. So then you've got these um, kind of irregular abstract shapes um, in between here. This is called Getting Things Straight. Not so straight after all, is it? Fabricating vacuum formed plastic. This is a wonderful fish. Fabricating stone. Um, this is sort of a, the combo plate here with found stone. Um, carved and sanded, but then stacked up to make the walls on Machu Picchu. And you can see this incredible way this has been fitted together, each, each stone here. And the reason for that is that the Andes down, you know, in Peru and Machu Picchu are, are part of this Incan world in the Andes. Um, there's a lot of seismic activity, earthquakes, and so if you had something very, very rigid, they would just fall down with each earthquake. So they made these, they're, they're huge structures that had a little give. There's, you mean you couldn't even put a piece of paper between these. I mean, they were amazingly engineered here. But when the shaking happens, there may be some sliding a little bit, but because there's some give, the whole thing doesn't fall down. It's, a wonderful piece of engineering. Uh, here again, manufactured wood. This is Michael Stevens, a mixed media piece where he painted um, and then added pieces of hand carved wood together. 
um, a lot of a lot of jewelry artists are really very fascinated. Yes, with metals, but also stones, semi-precious stones and rocks. So here we take these rocks, and how would you make something to group these beautiful sapphires um, together? This is called Moonlight Blossom Brooch. So um, taking these stones and adding um, silver, vines of silver around it. Okay, now we're going to get into a little bit of the subtractive thing. So you've got this chunk of wood. You can cut it out. Um, oftentimes people that think of themselves as subtractive artists or talk about subtraction, they're really sort of talking about, you know, revealing a form underneath. This one, not so much revealed, but having an idea ahead of time and cutting it out, subtracting areas to leave the forms that you want. In this case, a really cute toddler's toy. Um, Noguchi would actually use a lot of um, materials, whether wood, off, oftentimes rock, just as themselves, but in this case, leaving some of the outside texture of the original stone, the natural texture, but then sanding away areas, maybe peening with, with, with hammers that chip away little areas to make these really different natural and worked textures. This is the inside of a cave in India. So chiseling away on the interior, this is probably some kind of sandstone or limestone. So this is all here and they're just, I mean, you can only imagine this probably took, you know, a hundred years to do with many workers. Um, here's a piece here again, oftentimes when you started with wood, you were often working with big uh, monolithic tree trunks. And you can even see here, I, I hope, you can see sort of the surface of the trunk of the tree that was left, but then carving away to reveal this Egyptian man underneath, sometimes having to peg um, arms and other appendages. And here's a walking stick together. Um, Henry Moore used one big chunk of a a trunk of a tree. We have interior and exterior form. There's a figure inside this kind of encompassing womb-like form, almost hint hinting at a second interior form there. Um, sometimes carving, whittling down, whatever. Um, can you imagine carving these pieces of wood to make a bike chain. And these are functional. <laughs> you can find functional wooden bicycle forms. You've seen this before. This is St. Matthew um, by Michelangelo. And there again, that whole idea of, of is was Michelangelo just chipping away to reveal this saint coming out of this stone? Or did he just decide to stop because he liked this abstract look? How would he know that years later, Noguchi would be doing the same thing? Or possibly he just decided that he'd, he'd made this thing, but there really wasn't enough material in the back to make it a whole 3D in the round piece. Who knows? Anyway, it's a fantastic piece. Um. There's a cast bronze here. This is Brancusi. Maybe you're starting to recognize his work. But subtractive, his bases, and I don't know why we call them bases. Um, this is usually the, the more eye-catching dominant piece. But his bases are also just as intriguing. In this case, um, a chunk of marble that somebody chipped away and then sanded at to make this kind of... Um, geometric form down here. 
I've seen pieces of his where he might have this same sort of form down here, a cylinder here, another little cone or something like that. Um, these are marble elephants um, in a temple in India, subtractive technique, um, carving away at this thing, taking many, 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 many years. I wanted to just show you um, ways that people would come along here for millennia and put their hands, you know, touch these things, and they get a certain kind of patina. So subtractive work will often even be worn down somewhat by people's hands touching and creating a patina and wearing away. Like this little tiny fetish bird, it's called a bird stone. Um, I think this is a Native American piece, um, kind of a little finish fetish, a little good luck token or charm meant to be handled, meant to be fondled and just smoothed over the years by um, family members or tribal members touching it. Um, this piece is also in Machu Picchu. It's called the Hitching Post of the Sun. Um, it is used for worship of the sun and observing the movements of the sun. Um, carved areas, subtractive, and there again also leaving the natural stone there just on top. You're basically up on top of the Andes here when you go there to visit. Um, this is a really striking piece you can see by the lights and the darks um, with, the, with the different values here, making very dramatic statements with the shadows on this piece that, of course, would change throughout the day. Also, I'm sure wearing, you can see wearing. Um, even if when you go to Yosemite and the, the stone steps and paths that people made you know, last century um, are worn down because of people walking or horses walking or whatever. The last little bit here is, let's see, we had found objects, we had the additive technique of forming things, we had the subtractive technique, and now this last one, and I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but casting. Um, and here is a really ancient Chinese bronze vessel. Um, and the Chinese really took casting to an amazing spot, um, full of texture. Just here you can see this is a bird, kind of like a parrot bird form here with claws. Um, just wonderful, fantastical pieces. This is cast paper. Um, this is just a one, one piece mold where you would make the, make the form. Um, in this case, the opposite of this. This is um, convex where the, this female body shoots outward, but this person would have to make it um, concave or they made it out of another piece, did another cast. I don't know. It just this just it gets too complex for me to try and explain all this. But this is just a one piece cast or mold. And here you can see here's the positive. Um, somebody made this out of plaster, um, made a plaster mold around that, and then to strengthen it made another cast, another plaster mold around that. And these bumps key together to make it so that the thing doesn't, doesn't move. And here you see there's a little spot here where whatever material is coming in, whether they're using um, ceramic, this might be slip cast actually, um, using wet clay in here to make a hollow apple. Anyway, it gets very complicated. Casting is a wonderful way to, if you have some shape that you want to duplicate, maybe you wanted to make a huge installation of apples. There you go. Okay, you can make moldings, 
These are plaster in a silicone mold. You can buy those. You can see them making more silicone molds here, um, making fake stone elements for architecture. There you can see a silicone mold. Silicone is just a very kind of slippery, rubbery material. Pour whatever material you want, concrete, plaster, some other mixed thing. This is a hollow um, cast piece. Um, these very intricate blocks and put together to make this wonderfully woven, huge wall um, dividing piece. And you've seen Dwayne Hansen's work before. Um, the height of, you know, realistic um, representational work. No economy here, right? This is cast from a human being, and then it's cast in resin, colored, um, put with these other found objects um, to make something look absolutely real. And most of it is, except for this cast human form under there. So, um, which is polyester resin. So I hope sometime um, you get to see some kind of casting taking place, uh, maybe metal, ceramic, um, wax, plaster, cement, whatever it may be, um, jewelry making. But that's the end of this. So casting, the last um, construction method. So I, I hope that answers some questions for you and um, inspires you a little bit to go try out some of these techniques and um, good luck.